Okay, so who here were book fans first, and then, okay, who was movie fans first? Okay. It's only half and half. Okay, cool. So someone raised their hand for movie fans. Alright, yeah, that's right. Cool. Do you even uh, need these? Oh, yeah, for uh, recording. Oh, for recording. Okay. Are, are the cameras all set? Yep. So what should we talk about? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I want to start first by saying again, uh, first of all, thank you for doing the Q&A and letting us see oh, the movie. Thank you guys for staying, you know, like, it's cool to see an audience, it's great. Uh, also, I want to uh, once again say thank you to 20th Century Fox for letting us screen the movie way early, uh, which is really cool, and also a huge thank you to IMAX for uh, being such an awesome partner and for having such a kick-ass projection system. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think that uh, before the movie started, you mentioned something about uh, the laser projection. Yeah. And uh, so, how many? This is I wasn't even going to bring this up, but do you know how many theaters are doing laser for your movie? I think IMAX. I think it's only like seventy theaters that are laser projection IMAX, I believe. And then there's you know hundreds more that are xenon, which are different type of bulb and stuff. It looks different, but laser is the future. It's the same thing with uh, sorry competition, but uh, the Dolby uh, Vision stuff, the Dolby Cinema. It's the same thing. It's this fantastic um, new technology that I think all theaters should have. Uh, the, the, the one, one of the things that really uh, blew me away about the movie is right from the beginning, it's like full frame IMAX, like the aspect yeah. ratio. So could you sort of talk about that? Because that's something that I think more and more people are comfortable with watching the video stuff at home, but there's nothing ever like seeing, I mean, I think you'd all agree, there's nothing like seeing it in this huge screen. Yeah, and that's also, like I said before, we kind of designed it for that. If you notice, it's interesting that the directory of all three movies here, um, um, Oh, no, it's not your hand. It's, is it? It's <laughs> There you go. Wait, it might be better. I feel like you, you, you guys are, you guys, is it any better? It might just be me. Anyway, okay. <laughs> the, 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 the three trajectory movies was interesting that um, the point of view changes, basically. In the first movie, it's very much around Thomas's story, right? So. The movie's really seen through his eyes, so it's a kind of a smaller movie in a weird way, and plus it had to be because it was a, a very cheap budget movie. Second movie, we start to kind of branch out. We start to kind of see, you know, the perspective of Wicked. We start to see the perspective of Jorge and Brenda, these kind of outside group that kind of joins the group. And this third movie is very much about the three different points of view, and it kind of gives us license to kind of step away from just our main character, and it's more about the group, the family. And we chose to kind of do it with the shots themselves. I mean, you, you'll notice that there are a lot of drone photography this time too. A lot of it's camera, uh, helicopter stuff. There's a lot of drone shots which is like those little helicopters that carry a big giant camera, a 60 pound camera, it's like an eight, it's a real kind of a professional grade version of it, but it gives us these scale things that are just like, you, know, you, can't, you just can't beat them. And so it was fun to kind of think about that, you know, while we were shooting, I had to basically check for both the 240, which is a normal kind of uh, movie theater aspect ratio, which is like this, and then also at the same time while I'm shooting that, I have to take, take in mind what's in the top and bottom of the frame too, which gives you what you see in IMAX, which is a much, much bigger, frame and it's fun it, it doesn't I don't like the the format for TV because it's like a, a full 16 9 version we're used to seeing that with television there's something cinematic about the kind of widescreen 240 but for IMAX the format the screens that are around around the, the world um, that format was really I think great for for this uh, for this version of the movie a uh, little bit of a jokey question but I, I don't think the movie has enough uh, action in it <laughs> actually, I think it's actually got less action than the last movie, to be honest. It, it's crazy, though, because it's almost nonstop, and, and, and I want to address that you open the movie up with this kick-ass train sequence. Was it always the plan to open the movie with this big set piece? Yeah, it was always a plan. It was something me and TS were working on um, when we finished. It's, it's, a, it's a unique opportunity with me in these movies where each movie I'm just finishing up editing and the studio's asking me to work on the next one. So. On the first movie, uh, we were when the movie actually came out. So around this time last year, or the, the, in the first movie, uh, we were already a month away from shooting the second movie. We turned that movie around in a year, which arguably to me was too fast. It was too short of a window. Um, and then in this one, it's the same case. We had a couple, a little few months span uh, before we would jump right into this one. And um, and we always, after the very first movie, I wasn't planning on doing the second two. It wasn't a goal of mine. I thought I was going to do something else. But, you know, twist my arm and um, uh, decided to kind of jump into that second one and find my way in personally. Um, but that also meant that I knew that we'd do the third one. So what it meant is that me and TS, 
um, got to kind of really sit down and think about the trajectory of the first, the next two movies, rather than just doing the first movie. And it was about laying groundwork in the second movie for the third movie, and, and having things that would pay off, because we really liked that idea, for better or worse, that these aren't just sequels, they're actually a part of a whole, a part of a whole story, that, a kind of a saga, which I think was a great opportunity. There's not a lot of filmmakers that got the, got the chance to actually make three movies, especially their first three movies, uh, a one continuous kind of universe story. You know, even though that each, each movie was gonna be its own world, you know, there's the maze, there's the scorch, and now here's the kind of the world of Wicked. Um, it was it was fun that 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 it all kind of seems consistent in a way, I guess, in terms of the universe of the movie. And uh, that opening train thing was always, I think, pretty early on, always the idea that we wanted to start with kind of a, a big number up front. You know, something kind of fun and exciting. You know, I was thinking Return of the Jedi, going to save you know Han Solo. I was thinking um, Last Crusade and Indiana Jones. You know, they had that great kind of train robbery thing, and it was so cool that we've kind of done sort of like a little bit of a western there, except with horses. We have these old, you know, jalopies that they kind of got rigged up to work, these cars and stuff. Um, and it was just fun to kind of design a big number to kind of, you know, reintroduce the fans to the characters, but also kind of set up right from the get-go. This is a movie about rescuing their friend Minho, which obviously was an invention we had from the second movie, which a lot of fans were mad at me about. But it gave this movie, we knew, so much more stakes and, and drama. It was, it's a great carrot to, ha to, to hang in front of your, your characters to go after. And, and in my mind, the books didn't have that. Um, so that's why we invented that in the second movie, so we could, we could really spend time to like, you know, care about what these characters are doing in, in, the, in the third movie. And so uh, that, third, that, that first opening scene kind of sets up, I think, in a nutshell, what the movie's about, which is a small group of characters that are very capable, but they're, they are outnumbered. They're not like a, a huge revolutionary army or anything. Um, so yeah, that's where that, that kind of came from. Uh, you sort of touched on it, but it is, Hollywood and the movie studios are constantly trying to develop franchises. And often, I would say like 90% of them or 95% of them, they don't make the second movie. But this one, you managed to make a, a, a trilogy that's really popular around the world. What do you think it is? Because it's one thing for a book to be popular; yeah. it's another thing for a movie to be popular. What do you think? Uh, what, what do you think it is about the Maze Runner? That, uh, it's interesting. I'm still kind of deciding that myself. But I think there's a couple things, and I've thought about this a bit. But one thing we have to kind of keep in mind that is that the book series is, is it actually it's not as popular as the ones we get compared to like a Hunger Games or Divergent. I mean, we're a fraction of the book sales of those movies. I think they've changed since the movies have come out. <clears throat> but when we started, not a lot of people knew about these movies, <clears throat> these books. And so um, I think the second thing is that um, the fans, basically. The fans of the Maze Runner are just so rabid and passionate and they love these, these stories they're the ones who made it a success. They're the ones who made it a franchise after that first movie. The third thing is really the cost. And that's kind of something we're pretty, I think, proud about in general from these three movies is that you know, all combined, these movies cost what uh, a lot of tentpole movies cost for their single movie. We, we made the first movie for $30 million, we made the second movie for 60, and this one's a little bit, little bit over that. Um, kind, of, kind of comparative jump. So all together, it's, it's basically the price of one movie for a, a big, giant franchise. And so the fact that we were able to keep the cost down and try to deliver something that was, you know, a big movie for people to enjoy, um, it uh, it helped us kind of have the license to keep going, you know. But I think in general, it's really, it's not so much the concept of these movies that I think people kind of gravitate to. I mean, you guys can tell me, um, but I think it's the characters. It's the it's, it's those Newt and Thomas and me you know, and all these guys that you fall in love with, especially in that first movie, which has a great hook. You know, characters waking up inside of a giant maze. Um, that's all fun and it's fun and cool, but eventually it does lose its steam. And and so the thing that keeps you coming back, I think, are those guys and the, the relationships and the drama between them all. You know, one of the things that really impresses me about this movie and about all three movies is that uh, you make the VFX look really good for the money you have. I've seen, and I think we've all seen, so many movies that cost like 150 or 200 million dollars, and I'm like, that CGI, that's green screen. That looks terrible. The lighting doesn't match between the people standing there and the green screen and the stuff that they're trying to, you know, push in. And in this, it you can't tell where the it's very, very well done VFX. There's always shots that I like. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, I am a perfectionist, but it is it, part of it's because we have Weta. Weta is like the, the the best visual effects company in the world. These are guys that did, you know, Apes movies and Lord of the Rings and Avatar. They are the best. And it's really fun, they, they, they really enjoy working on our little movie because we, we do 
we don't do the really super big flashy stuff that's kind of impossible. We like to keep it pretty grounded, we keep, keep it pretty real, and we usually always base it on something we actually shoot. So for instance, the train stuff, there's nothing in there, um, anytime that Dylan's on a moving vehicle, for instance, um, he, was, he was never on a moving vehicle, essentially. It's all CG. Um, but we went out and put it in a parking lot, and we, we rigged up the car, and we put tons of fans on it, and we, and we shot it in real sunlight, so we're actually still racing the clock, and the, there's the inconsistencies of light that don't quite match, but um, it, it adds to something that we've had for over 100 years. There's a way of how you shoot things to make them feel real. Um, the cameras aren't doing anything too impossible, even though there might be, there might be some shots that are, how did they do that? Um, there's one shot in particular that I, I really love, and it's a shot when, when we're first in that train sequence, when we're first introducing um, Thomas. The, cam the cam camera flies over the crane, or over the, over the, the car of Hori and Brenda, over the train, and it finds this little car coming out of the, the horizon line. And we, we jump in to this shot that goes on the front of the car, low on the grass, comes around, swoops around, kind of finds Thomas driving in the, in the front seat, and then pulls away and shows them heading off towards the train. That's all one shot, and that's all CG, except for the guys. It's a parking lot. You know, we actually shot it for real with a real camera, um, but that was just an idea I had that I felt like it would work. It was a leap of faith, and I'm really proud that it kind of turned out, because it's a shot that you could not actually get in real life, but we shot it in a way that you, it doesn't feel like it breaks the laws of physics, but in reality, you would not be safe enough to actually try to get that shot. This, it, there's shots like that all over through the movie, actually, which is like why I think Weta has fun jumping onto these movies because you know it's not giant fighting, fighting robots or you know that kind of stuff, which is fun to do. They they like the kind of more subtle, um, just straight compositing work, you know, which is is fun to do, you know, and and it's it is a because we shoot so much reference for it, it's an easy not an easy thing, but it's 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 close, easier to get to a point where you don't question it, hopefully. But you know, I'm sure a lot of VFX guys out there are gonna see it and say, oh, that was that shot. I would too, but. That's that. I'm, I'm telling you, I see a lot of movies. I'm giving you a lot of credit on the VFX, and I think that the audience would agree. It really is seamless. Yeah, well, also, you know, I, I spent a lot of time doing VFX. That was kind of where I got my start, was doing VFX side of things. So I know how it can be used as a crutch or a tool. So, um, you know, and, and plus we have, you know, a great crew around us that keeps us from, you know, going too far, you know. Uh, I've asked you this, I think, on the last movie or the second movie, but let's jump into this one. Uh, how long was your the movie's two hours, 20 minutes? How long was your first cut? Uh, three hours. <laughs> <laughs> now we should we should uh, describe. Usually, it. most things like, are about that. Is, um, was that an assembly cut, or was that a cut you were happy with? No, it had to come down for sure. The thing is, you shoot a lot of stuff, and the thing is, on this movie, there's a lot more deleted scenes in this movie than we had before. It's a really complicated movie this time because, you know, not only do we have all the gladers in their point of view. We have the kind of new group of people that we set up in the second movie that we have to we have to wrap up. We also have Wicked, that side of the story we have to also wrap up. So it's a really tricky puzzle this time to give what we have never really had before in the previous movies. We've always had cliffhangers on the end. We've never had a the end. And so this time we get to really try to build to a satisfying end to this kind of franchise, you know, hopefully a, a farewell to not just the, the crew and the cast and the fans, but you know, the, these characters and the story that hopefully people have you know, grown up kind of liking. Um, but uh, yeah, it's tricky. We're jumping into deleted scenes without getting anything specific, but uh, uh, what's gonna be on the Blu-ray for fans? There's gonna be like... a lot of stuff actually. It's all, it's all stuff that's just a shame that had to get cut. But there's just, you know, there's just a, an element of, you know, <laughs> for me, Blade Runner couldn't be long enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, but especially when Blade Runner came out and, it, and, it, and that seemed to be a thing that people, you know, pointed at and said, that's why people didn't go to that movie. Um, You're talking about 2049. Yeah, the, the most recent one. Um, that it's a shame that it, you know, wasn't as well liked, or at least people didn't go to see it, but I think it's like a masterpiece to me. But, um, yeah, you're not, you're not but anyway, <laughs> all right. Um, but, you know, I, I actually, we actually did test a version, a screen test, a, a version that was two, an hour, two hours and third, no, two hours and 27 minutes. And it was great, it was fine, it was good. But the studio has a certain appetite and they have certain data that says, you know, movies need to be a certain length. And, you know, for whatever reason, the magic number is 221. Hunger Games, uh, you know, uh, if you look at just about any movie that Fox has released, I think even recently, um, Kingsman, it's that magic, uh, Wonder Woman's 221. For whatever reason, that's the magic number. So that was what we had to get to, and that meant, unfortunately, cutting some of the things that they don't hurt the story not being there, 
but I, I always felt like they do help kind of, you know, fall in love a little bit more. So that stuff will be on the DVD. And, you know, right now there isn't an appetite for me to do an extended cut of the movie because there's a cost associated with that, unless the movie is really successful in the box office and, uh, and fans kind of demand it. Um, it'll just be deleted scenes. But, you know, fingers crossed, maybe I'll get to do a version of the movie that uh, has a little bit more of the stuff that I cut, which is some great stuff. We probably spent about a week of shoot, uh, there's about a week of stuff that I cut um, that I think belongs in the movie. There's always stuff that you cut that doesn't belong in the movie, but there's probably about 10, 12 minutes of stuff that uh, is actually, I think, really good and actually only enhances kind of the story that you see on screen. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's this really cool sequence, maybe I shouldn't say it, but there's this really cool sequence where Galley and the guys... Um, oh, should I give you a spoiler warning? Uh, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's talk about it for a second, guys. Cameras, can't cut this out. Help me. Help me, please, don't spoil some of the stuff that's in this movie. The book fans, they know. They know about Galley. They know he's going to come back. The book fans, they know about Newt. They know about Teresa. There's a lot of people. There's probably two-thirds of the people that fans of this movie that haven't read the book, so they don't know that stuff's coming. So, as a favor to me, go tell your friends, hopefully, that you love it. they got to go see it in IMAX. But don't tell them what happens. Try to hold that, because there's nothing like, there's nothing like, you know, if there's any viewers in here, that have just followed the movies, the surprises that happen, the things, the twists and turns. There's nothing like experiencing that for the first time fresh. So, you know, because it's so early, try to withhold the spoilers until, at least until release day. What's really funny is I was talking about the deleted scenes, yeah, but that's sorry. also a good point. Yeah, so I just want to bring that up. But anyway, deleted scenes, there's this split <laughs> no, scene where... It's, no, it's really important, though, like, to, to keep the spoilers in because it doesn't come out for another, like, Yeah, it's nothing else, just for, as, as fellow movie fans, you know, to rob someone of that, that experience <laughs> is no fun. But, uh, uh, yeah, there's this cool scene with Galley. Uh, there's a couple things with Galley, actually. There's one where he specifically kind of mentioned Chuck and talked about that a little bit more. And it was, it was great. It was good. It, was just a, it fell into a point in the movie, usually in the middle, where the movie's always sad. It always happens. Um, and it just felt like we couldn't afford the time. And there's another big scene, like this big subway race, essentially, down below the city that they had with Galley and Newton Thomas. It was just really cool, like, very Maze Runner-esque kind of sequence where they're out running a subway train down below. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of VFX costs to that, so it had to kind of go. But, uh, you know, maybe one day it'll see the light of day. Uh, I want to ask you, now that the, the trilogy is over, has there been any talk about doing, like, the ultimate box set on Blu-ray? Yeah, yeah. That's number one. And do you have a lot of deleted scenes from the first movie and second movie that have, like, still never seen the light of day? So you could do something, you know, ultra special for the fans if the studio decides. Yeah, that would be my dream, you know, is to do an ultimate kind of cut. Not a director's cut, because I think these movies are, you know, the movies that I pretty much wanted them to be. Um, they would just be kind of enhanced, kind of, you know, extended editions, I guess. But, you know, all the movies do have some element of, um, of uh, deleted scenes. The first one, less so. The second definitely has a few really great scenes. And again, the same thing, where it just felt like we, we misplaced where those scenes landed in the, in the, in the movie and paces what killed us. So, you know, I hate cutting those scenes, because the actors do so well in them, and they actually do work. Um, but uh, you make these choices, you know. Totally. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, storyboarding versus finding stuff in the moment. Uh, do you previs everything? Do you storyboard everything? Uh, and you know how much is right there. I on don't the actually. I don't spend a lot of time prevising or storyboarding. Um, there's always the big sequences that you need to give someone something. So it's like if there's key shots I know I want to get, you know, on the train, and they need to know that they need to build the train this side should, of the train. We should actually say what's a key shot. Yeah, uh, a, a key shot of like you know. Say, for instance, that shot that I mentioned of Thomas and, and the reveal of Thomas and Newt or Barry driving in the train. Like, I knew I wanted that shot. So actually, I went and personally did that previous shot. I actually kind of rigged up the car and animated it and animated the camera to show exactly what I wanted to do. That was it. So that meant, okay, we need a green screen on this side. And what was kind of funny is that we have these fans going. We're in a parking lot. If you saw the raw plate, which you'll eventually see, there's basically, you couldn't build a green screen big enough. Um, and it would also cast a lot of shadow. So basically, we had two guys basically do -si doing with the camera. So you see these guys scurrying along in the background, <laughs> trying to stay behind Thomas and as the camera came, came around. So it's that kind of stuff. We plan for things. But in the, for the most part, I find that uh, storyboarding previous is, they, they, they don't really help me because you get out there on set and invariably end up throwing it in away anyway because movies are basically compromised from, from, from the get-go. It's just, it's just the nature of the, of the beast, basically. And so you're just fighting, basically, the, everything that's coming at you and it's amazing that any movie gets made and makes any sense because of you know how hard it is to make these things. But um, for the most part, I, I like being out there and kind of getting inspired by the moment, letting the actors kind of you know 
uh, where do you want to stand and what do you want to do? Now, there's always things that I kind of know what's going to happen, but it's really fun to be there when it kind of spontaneity hits and you get magic. You know, for instance, there's a, there's a shot when the car uh, in the crank tunnel, when the car flips over and skids on the top of its roof. Um, the original plan for that, something we planned for, was that it was gonna it was gonna skid and hit. It was gonna hit on its side because I had this whole sequence worked out where they were gonna kick out the sunroof and crawl out the sunroof while the cranks are coming in. And so while we were kind of rehearsing the shot, rehearsing the shot, of course we only get like one or two takes maybe of that shot. And so we got everything going and we got the stunt guys in the car and you had the flashlights going. And they ran up the thing, the ramp, and it went over and it went over on its top, which was not planned for. And so you know. <laughs> Everyone's holding their breath in that moment, and I, I just kind of said, guys, is everyone okay? And I said, don't cut the cameras, don't cut the cameras, is everyone okay? Move your flashlights around if you're okay. So you see them moving the flashlights around in the thing. I said, okay, slowly with the camera, push in really slowly, which wasn't planned. You see it in the shot, this slow shot, this thing coming in close, coming in close, and finally you get this little moment where, okay, it was, it was, uh, it was one of the stunt guys, I said, okay, now look out the window, look out the window, and you see him upside down, and if you turn that shot oh, oh, upside down, that's not Dylan. It's actually a stunt double, but you can't tell because it's upside down. But that's one of those things where you just got to be ready for like magic to kind of strike. You know what I mean? And that happens with performances. That happens with everything. And that's that's really to me the beauty of of um, of, of the movies in a way is that there's a kind of quality to them that's kind of raw and sort of and, and unpolished. You know, all the movies, all the three movies that we've done. And so I really appreciate that kind of like that spontaneity that happens. You know, on the process. I'm going to open it up to people in the audience, but uh, I have one last question while you guys think of questions. Uh, you must have done a test screening or two. Yeah. What did you learn from the test screening process that impacted the finished film? Fans are great. I mean, it was, it was we basically screened the first, first movie, and it was just insane. It was 400 people that lined up to come see the first movie. Um, it's super rough, no effects basically. It was the roughest version I've ever shown, and it was a great response. And honestly, the movie hasn't changed that significantly, other than just trimming and, and getting the runtime down for the studio. Um, um, there's always little things of confusion and things that you know. Uh, do they really like this? Uh, what was always kind of surprised me with again, spoiler, you can't use this is is Galley. Um, you know, we had to bring him back, but people seem to really like Galley in this movie. Um, so that was kind of a surprise to us a little bit because he is obviously the adversary in the first movie, but you know Will Poulter plays it so well, and he's a he's a good kind of you know um, a character kind of bring back from the first one, and and thematically it works well because it's really a story about Thomas having to kind of wrestle with his demons of his past. He's got to kind of confront Teresa. He's got to confront you know Galley. You know people he thought were his enemies are now his friends. People that he thought were his friends are now his enemies. That kind of thing. It was, it's an interesting kind of like dilemma story wise for the characters that I think is. Um, you know, kind of fun. That was it, it. Was nice to kind of see that audiences were willing to go in a place that maybe isn't quite conventional. I mean, if you think about it, the, the main character, um, you know, he doesn't save the, the the world at the end of the movie. He doesn't do anything particularly heroic except try to rescue his friends, and and that kind of sense of self selflessness, you know, kind of shows through. But in the end, he needs his friends to save him, which is kind of a cool idea that you, know, you usually don't see in these kinds of movies. You know, so. The fact that fans were kind of, you know, or at least the people that we screened it for, um, including people who hadn't seen the previous two movies, it scored it really well. And, you know, I think it's a little bit of kind of voodoo. It, you don't, you get a card, a bunch of numbers, you know, that, that don't quite make sense. Um, and you have to kind of read between the lines and, and decipher them. But, uh, you know, it, it's something you kind of have to do. Uh, just a reminder before I uh, call on people, um, is people recording and some of it could be live, who knows? If you guys could not ask spoiler questions, that would be awesome. I see your hand right there. Yeah, do me a favor, guys. Don't put that galley stuff in there. <laughs> How's it going? Hey, man. Uh, just want to say, excellent movie. Cool, it's the thanks. best one. I feel like it's your Return of the King. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is really a, good. Really it well is, done. It is, it is uh, more epic this time. And again, part of that's just because we have to wrap it up. We have to wrap up all these stories, all these characters. Um, but it's definitely, you know, each one has to get bigger, you know? <laughs> exactly. The movie was uh, kind of in the public spotlight for the reason Dylan O'Brien yeah. is in that accident. If, if you don't mind me asking, what scene was it that you guys were shooting that he was in the accident? And how did that experience change your perspective as a director? Uh, it was the train. Um, in fact, there's, there's one shot of Dylan on a car, and that shot's in the movie. Um, it was... Uh, you know, Dylan's obviously talked a lot about it. I guess when he was doing the American Assassin stuff, um, it's 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 a kind of a personal thing. It's it's a tough thing. I mean, 
me personally, it was the most awful experience I can imagine um, that I've ever really had and probably ever will have. Um, you know, I was there, it was just a couple of us. Um, we were out away from everyone else and Dylan got hurt, um, you know, very badly. And uh, I, was, I was the first person to run up to him actually. Um, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a scar that I'll carry too, you know, forever basically. Um, it is my set, you know, it, it's my responsibility and, and it's, it's important for my actors to feel safe on my set and I feel like I let him down, you know, so that was a, that was a tough thing to swallow and, and it sort of definitely changed the way I approach um, how we do things. It was something that we did that we thought was safe but we, we didn't see, um, we didn't see how something bad could have happened. Um, we didn't foresee it, and uh, you know that's that's on us. And Dylan took you know the full extent of that that mistake, um, so it's something that I'll regret forever. And fortunately, you know I think the the happy ending here is that you know Dylan got back on the horse and he went out there and and despite having some you know real you know not just kind of physical scars but internal scars essentially from the experience, he still chose to get up and 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 finish this movie for everybody. You know so. I think it's a it's a big testament to sort of his commitment and and sort of his you know perseverance. I think as as just a as an artist, you know. Um, so I'll be forever sort of in his debt. I think and and, uh, and I'll, I'll carry the experience with me forever, of course. And and Val will never <laughs> let it happen again. You know. Thank you. Right there. Marissa. I went to the first um, actually the first screenings of each film. The uh-huh. one Comic Con, the one. That's in right. LA. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. And I asked you a question at the LA Comic Con or the LA screening that one. I said, yeah. yeah. What scene took the longest to get right in your in your opinion? Uh, the question is so with the audio, what scene took the what scene was the took the most takes to get right? What scene took the most Good takes question. to get right? It's tricky because obviously the train took a long time because it's a lot of days. Um, hmm. It's a tricky one. This, the, this kind of uh, the crank tunnel thing was pretty difficult. It was a just a tricky location. It was a real tunnel. It was like seven kilometers long. Um, it was, uh, that was a really tricky one because it, you can't move around. It's hard to understand unless you've kind of been around movie sets, but it's, it's a really tr- tricky logistically because there's nowhere to hide. You have to look down this tunnel and you can't have the crew sitting down there um, because there's, you know, the crew is, it's a circus. I mean, it's huge, um, the footprint. And so it means I have to shoot everything going this way with the crew behind me. And then we want to turn around, I have to move all the trucks down the other side of the tunnel and then shoot this way for that shot. So if you have reverse, you know, they're all shot separately. So to keep that kind of logistical kind of nightmare straight is really difficult. And of course, when those trucks all, all moved, they kicked up all the dust, all the dust fills up in the tunnel and it just becomes a freaking nightmare. Um, but it looks cool. <laughs> uh, so there's that scene. Um, you know, I don't know. It's always it's always interesting. I always have the most fun with kind of the, the the smaller quiet scenes. Like there's that scene in the church. We were in that church for two days, and and I really like that kind of quiet, intimate stuff with like you know going in and out of these perspectives of different kind of characters. These groups, you know, Thomas and Teresa, Jorge and Brenda, um, you know, Newt and the gang and Galley, and then how they all kind of sort of you know bounce off each other. You know, that was really a lot of fun. That that took you know a, a fair amount of time for something that was only about six minutes in the movie. You know. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I have to look back on it, I guess, a little bit on what particular scene was probably the toughest. But, um, you know, we were moving so fast. If you've noticed, there's there's more locations in this movie than we have probably in both movies combined. Um, we're moving really fast through all this stuff. But, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a whirlwind, but it was fun. Uh, right there. But what, could, uh, could we use the mic? Yeah. That way. I want to make sure everyone can hear. By the way, guys, we can ask questions about John Paisano over there. Raise your hand, John. John did John did our scores for every single movie, and uh, I think they're fantastic. Yeah, nice work, John. It's a it's like a it's like a blend of like when I first met him, like I was I always wanted to do something that was kind of movies that I love, which were very orchestral. They were John Williams, it was Star Wars, it was Indiana Jones. I love that stuff. I didn't want to do necessarily the Hans Zimmer thing. Of course, we needed some of that, so John found this kind of great way to do this kind of thing in between the two, this kind of classical, um, you know, orchestral sound, but with kind of synthetic kind of un- overtones, I guess, that kind of gave it a kind of an edge, which was cool. And then you got T.S. over there. T.S. wrote the screenwriter for all three movies, too. So, yeah. right, yes. so if you have questions, you can ask them and they can come talk, too. Anyway, go ahead, go ahead. Um, so I was wondering, um, 
how come Teresa, Thomas, and Eris weren't telepathic? So that was obviously, so that's the question of books versus movies, right? Um, I'll be honest, I think it would have never worked in a movie. There's something that would be incredibly cheesy if the shots were... <laughs> Say something. Uh, you did a good job directing the movie. Mm -hmm. And then you answer back, <laughs> someone else says something. It doesn't work visually. It works in a book, and that's the thing about the challenge of these two things is like, the books has things that um, that are they're easy in words to kind of like you know put your own spin in your head, right? You kind of find your own way to connect those dots and make them work. But when a movie, it's something that everyone has to kind of agree on. It has there's kind of universal kind of quality to how you execute that stuff. There's always that kind of you know taste thing that's involved. But um, I just I could not figure out a way to make that kind of work visually and not be super cheesy. And that kind of goes in. in, in, in even bigger beyond some of the other choices that we made in terms of the movie, like like the maze in the very first one um, was in this kind of giant holographic kind of underground sort of cavern. And I just felt like what was really important was something that was so fantastical and so kind of far-fetched uh, is what you need. We need to treat it in a way that was as grounded and real as possible so that you bought it, so that you bought the drama was real. Um, so that was a choice. And then also, even in the first one, was this things like uh, them not having running water and, and actual houses in the glade. I thought it was more interesting that what you see in an image, in one visual, is a group, a, a village that they built with their own hands. And that kind of told you something story-wise, that, that you know, the trick is you've got a 300-page book, I've got a 100-page script. So how do, you, how do you condense ideas down and distill it down into something, that, the essence of what the book was trying to capture? But do something that you can actually execute in a, in, in a visual form, you know. So that's always the balance. That's always the thing that TS and I struggle with: is what do you change from the book? What do you keep? And how do you execute it? Can you execute it? Um, yeah. So that's uh, hopefully you you uh, were okay with the changes I made. <laughs> uh, before we get to the next question, uh, I did a set visit on the first movie. I saw you working. Do you want to tell people? Do people realize how many poisonous snakes were on set with you guys? A lot, yeah. We've always kind of had some uh, uh, grand adventures on our movies, and this one we had baboons and and uh, you know <laughs> crazy stuff. This time, this time we shot in South Africa, Cape Town, which was uh, obviously a different continent. It was fantastic, great, great locations. Yeah, the first one we had a ton of snakes because we we're out in the swamps. And there's something about me. I like to be on a real location. I don't like being on stage. Um, there's something about there's something too comfortable about it, and and part of what's interesting on a movie is the suffering. You kind of want to sweat and you want to race the clock because you're moving fast, and there's just something about being in the real place. And when you do that, you kind of get the the side effect is you know you're wrestling alligators and you know snakes. Well, I just want to point out that on the first movie, I think you had or the cast slept over in the location. Mm -hmm. I think without realizing that there was a ton of poisonous snakes because when we I had was guys out there to protect them in the case. I saw a bucket. On, on the harvest. set that had like a yeah. two huge snakes in it that were totally poisonous. Yeah, totally. I was right <laughs> next to one. I mean, you know. But I grew up in Florida. I grew up, you know, in the middle of nowhere, so I'm used to it. I had a three-legged alligator on a leash for a, a couple of days. <laughs> um, you know, it's, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I, I don't know. <laughs> it was fun. They all had a good time. We always had people out there to kind of keep things safe. But yeah, it was a harrowing adventure for sure. Uh, next question right there. There's a microphone coming. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about um, the, the actors and mm -hmm. the characters, because obviously, as the director, you're overseeing everything, even from the beginning of the casting process. Mm -hmm. So especially when you're doing a trilogy, you're kind of casting for a whole franchise. Yeah. So what my question is, is that, you know, obviously, when you get thousands and thousands of tapes and things like that, what is something that you look for that really stands out to you when you're looking for these characters? And I remember you said that like Dylan was one of the first tapes you ever saw and you remembered his audition. Yeah. And little things like that, you always are curious, okay, what did, what did, what did the director see in them? You know? It's magic. magic. <laughs> are, are you, uh, do you want to be an actress? I am an actress. Okay, cool, great. So, I don't know, I wish I could tell you what the answer is. It's, it's, a, it's a weird thing, for, like for instance, Brenda, um, saw a bunch of, bunch of girls come in and audition for that. And uh, and then Rosa came in on Scorch Trials when we were re re um, auditioning for that, and there was just something about her. It just for me it clicked. For whatever the picture is I have in my head of what the movie could be, um, you know, it's it's not it's not my movie. It's really our movie. It's the cruise. It's everyone's thing. <coughs> my job is just to kind of like steer it towards that that vague picture of a thing that I see off on the horizon. And so <clears throat> as people come on and start contributing ideas. 
all the, the only measure, the only test that I have is does it fit into that picture, that grand scheme of thing that I'm, I'm heading towards? Sometimes just going on faith. And Brenda uh, Rosa was 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 one of those choices in that movie. In that particular time, she had a shaved head. It was totally strange. Like you know, I remember the studio was like, no, you know, and I'm like, no, there's something about it. Her, her attitude, her, you know, there's something about it. It can be so great for this character, and I need something that was different than Teresa. You know, in the books, she had long hair, she had long brown hair, and I'm like, I don't need another girl that has long brown hair to compete with this Teresa character. Again, back to the thing, in the books, you can kind of very clearly, you know, decide, you know, okay, two different people. In the movies, you can't, you know, so I needed that kind of visual distinction thing, so the short hair kind of worked for us in that case, you know. Um, Dylan, yeah, it was just, it was, a, it was a case where I saw thousands of tapes. He was the last guy we cast. You know, I saw this one guy, and I was like, nope, not him. It, that hair is too much. He had it's this whole story everyone knows now, probably. It's that he had this kind of MTV Styles hair. It was all spiked up and everything. I was like, that's definitely not Thomas. I wanted a kind of innocent boy. You know what I mean? And so we kept looking. And I found I got a couple people that were really good. And we auditioned them, and we got really close to, to, to casting them. And I ended up testing all three of them. And then, um, but before that, I guess, I guess we should say is that someone kind of mentioned again, what about the, there's this kid that worked for us in, I think it was the internship. You know, and I saw this picture of him, like, you know, he had his hair down that time. I think he had a beanie on or something. He had glasses on. I was like, huh, I'll check him out. Sure. I went and uh, saw and it, it brought me back the tape. And as soon as this picture popped up on that tape, I remembered it. I remembered his audition from before that told me something, right? There's something that kind of, so I've been, I've been more attuned to, like, those, those little those little moments of magic that, to be aware of them. You know what I mean? It's like I almost didn't have Dylan in these movies. You know what I mean? And that would have been a shame. Um, we're thanking Sean Levy in the internship. <laughs> yeah, to get it all started. That's right. So, you know, so I don't know. I'm not sure what it is. It really just it, I, I I I envy you guys, actors. Um, auditions are terrible. They're it's an awful experience. I hate it. For me, even um, on the other side of it, um, fortune is a necessary thing. But you know, I guess if there's anything anything out there, if you get discouraged and you just go out and you can't get your parts and all that stuff, and you think you're doing a good job and you're being hard on yourself and you're you're trying to advance your abilities, that's all you can do because at at, at some level, there's something that you can do that will make it work for you, right? It's it's kind of a if you work for what they're trying to do, it works. You know what I mean? So. Don't take it too personally if you're not, not casting things. You know what I mean? It's like just keep getting out there, keep doing your thing, and eventually, you know, it's gonna it's gonna strike. It's gonna work. You know what I mean? So anyway, sorry. I, I spoken to a number of directors about the casting process, and sometimes they is it for you that when someone walks in within like three seconds, yeah, you have a really good feeling. Yeah, and that was like I said after that experience with Dylan, like I, I kind of like like I came in, I knew I wanted Galley right off the bat. I didn't ask for anyone else. I knew I wanted uh, Teresa as Kaya because I've seen her on Skims. Um, Thomas Brody Sangster, he actually auditioned for Galley. And uh, and then I was looking at him, I was like, he's a newt. <laughs> and he became newt. Um, he hung, and I cast him right away off his tape. Um, you know, again, I talked about, talked about Rosa. Um, John Carlo was suggested to me. Barry was suggested to me. Aiden was an obvious choice, you know, having it being a Game of Thrones fan. Um, you know, everybody, I think we've been really fortunate with our cast that we've gotten, you know, just good actors. You know, they're great actors. And they all have to be very pretty too, but um, that was that was, that was what we looked at first. We we didn't want to kind of go for like you know just you know the, the pretty face or the handsome dude, whatever. We wanted someone that could actually be willing to go there to be vulnerable. I mean, Dylan's crying in this movie a ton. You know, it's like this is probably the most emotion he's been in all the movies because it's so heavy and everything. But um, yeah, it's uh, it, you do you do kind of feel it right away. You know, totally. Uh, we're basically out of time, but I'm gonna do another Shit. one last question. Uh, wait, I, I want to put this out there. We want to end on a really good, solid question. So I want to see the hand that goes up that you feel confident that you are the absolute last question. I'll keep Anybody? it short to maybe fit two. Or we could do two that are very short. Do you want to? Do you want? I've picked all of them. Do you want to pick? Go ahead. Go ahead, right there. Okay. What helped you decide to make the Maze Runner trilogy? Uh, it was the first book. I felt like I knew how to do that movie. You know, I knew how to do that movie. I, I had a very clear idea of what it was supposed to be. It was a, the character dynamic, the mystery, and the Lord of the Flies aspect. That was something that's just, I love that stuff. I, I felt like I grew up that way. I used to do that stuff in my childhood. I'd go out in the, in the woods and I'd build these little fortresses for myself, you know? So I just felt like a real connection to that sort of concept of characters, you know? And then ultimately it was just the opportunity 
um, to make a movie. I have been trying to do this for 10, 12 years, you know, since film school. Um, and someone hands me, you know, permission to go make a movie, I'm going to take it, <laughs> you know. And then the, the, the next challenge was really how do I find my way into the next two? You know, that was, that was my challenge personally. It was how do I kind of like, you know, um, do something that I, I just can't do it unless I love it and I see it. So that was kind of where the book changes came in and stuff like that. It's just I had to find my way in. Yeah, yeah, I'll repeat it. How did you feel like you have such a big fan base? Like, I know you did this in North Korea in terms of people. Yeah, that was crazy. Like, did you expect to be able to, like, this big? Yeah, so talking about the fan base and how uh, how that has been with such a big fan base. And, and you mentioned the Korea thing. That just happened. I guess uh, that looked crazy. And, and but the truth is, you know, 75% of all of our money that we made, it comes from international. So we're really strong as a movie series internationally. I think it's because it's kind of a universal kind of a story that it's not necessarily tied up in sort of an American way, essentially. That's why it kind of you know, translates better than say others that, are, that we are compared to. Um, the fans are awesome. I mean, I, I, I got, I mean, it's truly the best fans ever. Good job, guys. <laughs> um, honestly, I really, really do mean this. Like this, this, this movie wouldn't be made without you guys. You know, I mean, the fact that you support it and you go out and you tell your friends that you want to go see it and that you, you, you know, there's, there's no better marketing anywhere than word of mouth. <coughs> word of mouth from your, from your friends telling you someone means so much more than a critic telling you that it's bad or good. And so the fact that you guys went out there and like, you know, passionately kind of told people, no, you should check this out, you know, starting with the books all the way to the movies, you know, like that you're the ones who gave us the opportunity to make these things, you know, so, you know, I thank you guys. You know, it, it's funny that the uh, social media really matters because if you look at Friday, it, whatever the tracking is, it doesn't matter. It, it matters, but like on Friday, what what people are saying on Twitter and Facebook, the at like friends to friends, like oh my god, I just saw Maze Runner and it was awesome, and you need to go see it. That carries a lot of weight. That happened with Deadpool. It was yeah. supposed to make like forty million dollars, and it made like two billion. Or, you know, opening weekend. Oh, I'm exaggerating, but you we know won't make that. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Deadpool is one of those great things where it's like, you know, there's a time right now in movies, and we'll just talk about it before they kick us out. Um, there's a time right now in movies where one, let's not get political, but the, the, there is a there is a, a frame of mind in the world right now that things are not working as smoothly or as well as they should, um, and so I think that's why you're seeing some of these other movies, like Jumanji, for instance just explode beyond their expectations because people do want to go into a theater and just kind of escape for a little bit. They want to escape their world for a while. And I think Deadpool also was in, the, in an era of, you know, every month or two we get basically a, a, another Marvel movie or a DC movie in, in some cases. Um, Deadpool felt fresh. It felt different. And, and a lot of that goes to me, to Tim Miller. I'm, I'm friends with Tim. When I first kind of started uh, Maze Runner, I went to Tim and kind of got some advice from him because he's been kind of, you know, in and around the world of Hollywood forever, but um, th it's 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 an interesting time in the movies right now because we we do need to, you know, you know, get people to get excited about going to see a movie again, you know, and a part of that is presentations like this and IMAX to see it as well as possible. Um, all the competing things we have with you know TV and Netflix and all these great other all, all these other great platforms. Um, <coughs> It's an interesting time for the movie industry in general, I think, where we have to really kind of adapt a little bit to what else is offered out there and what can you only get right here on this big giant screen, you know? Dude, um, and so let, let's end it there. And I, I really want to say once again, thank you to IMAX for letting us show the movie tonight in un effing believable projection and sound. Uh, and again, a huge thank you to Tony Century Fox for letting us show the movie like a week and a half before it comes out. Fox, it's mom and dad. They let, no. us, let us come out and show the movie. And also to all of you guys for coming out on a Tuesday night to see the movie yeah. and Wes. Yeah, thanks, guys. Woo. Wes, thank you for making a kick-ass trilogy. Thank you, for making a kick -ass trilogy thank you sir. And delivering it. Uh, you guys all have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank thanks, you, Fox. Guys. Thank you. Yeah.